The Larson press may just be my favorite way of benching. And after thoroughly abusing it for quite some time now, I have some new insight that I'd love to share with you. The first being a rather bold point. A leg drive is overrated. Yeah, you heard it right here. This is coming from a man who has heavily promoted this concept in the past. All due to stability. You're planted, tight into the ground, you can produce more force. Overall, heavier loads can be lifted, so it's a good thing, right? At least, that's what it seemed like upon first glance. But once you actually get in the trenches, you start to understand that there is a continuum to stability. And what I want to point out here is that the Larson press is stable enough. Put this in perspective. Most of your body is still on the bench. And you can only lift about 5 to 10% less than with heavy leg drive. So it's obviously a self-limiting variation, but not to a significant extent, especially for the majority of you who aren't elite benchers, because that percentage I just listed scales according to your one rep max. The ratio of a two plate bencher will be vastly different from a three plate bencher. And in either extreme, the upper body is still thoroughly stimulated, especially when compared to other effective bodybuilding motions that are inherently unstable, like the dumbbell bench press. Everyone will tell you the same thing. It's more unstable than the barbell bench press, yet it seems to be extremely effective for giving you carryover and improving pectoral size. So how would that same logic not apply to Larson press? Of course it does. And the proof is in the pudding, not only in the powerlifting scene, but also bodybuilders who never use leg drive. Most of them don't, and it doesn't seem to be holding back their muscular potential in any kind of way. So I would actually make the argument that for pure hypertrophy training, you don't need leg drive. So that can either be a Larson style or just having your feet on the floor, but you're not doing anything with them. Moving forward, let's talk about an underrated benefit that you would never expect, but is so true. The Larson press will improve your lockout strength like no other. In other words, the ability to strain, grindability, is greatly enhanced. Bottom difficulty is exaggerated. You're less explosive and the strength curve is slightly different in the sense that as you get closer to failure, you'll have to grind sooner and a lot more. Also, when compared to the bench press, matching the exact same percentages, you will have less reps in reserve. I know that sounds crazy, but you'll understand this the moment you do a Larson press. So please be careful because you might actually fail the rep when you think you got one more. And I'm talking about the final extension of the arms, which just goes to show that many lifters are unintentionally raising their butts off the bench or using some kind of compensation strategy to lock out a load that under strict conditions they would really struggle with. So that's why perhaps these will benefit you more than using accommodating resistance and partials. Maybe this was the issue all along. You just had to get stronger in the most compromised way. Next, a secret benefit of Larson pressing is that your lower back will be less involved. It's a lot more flat, especially when you look at it from a side angle. And there's less interference when we talk about lower body training. You know how I always discuss blending your sessions? not doing free weighted rows because it involves the spinal rectors. Well, the same thing happens here. If you had a lower body session the day before, your ability to use leg drive will be compromised to some extent. And getting that maximum arch in could be a little bit uncomfortable, especially if you're really sore. Also, the reversal occurs. If you're doing a lot of heavy benching, that can affect your squats and deads, even though you would think that's not even a possibility. Like how much is it really gonna make a difference? As minor as it may be, it's still something that you'll notice. And I can personally attest to this because I'm one of the few guys in YouTube fitness that did bench press specialization while being super fucking lazy with legs. So now that I'm doing both equally, I can tell you that the Larson Press is better on net recovery. Not only in terms of getting more or less weight, but also, systemic fatigue as you engage the entire body on a press. And that's also why I'm starting to gravitate towards seated overhead pressing of all things. I want my upper and lower body training to be as divided as possible. And the Larson press does exactly that. You no longer have to worry about maximum tightness. 
Furthermore, I want to talk about a study on the feet of bench press that Jeff Nippard referenced two years ago. It was basically determined that chest activation was higher compared to feet on the floor. And I recall at the time, many people were criticizing the study, claiming that because the loads were equated, obviously you're going to see more chest activation because you have to produce more force in general. And secondly, the study was very short term. So just by that, the results were skewed. And so many of us ended up dismissing it, myself included, always considered it to be junk science. But now, years later, I find myself revisiting those findings, that there were some grains of truth, because anecdotally, it matches up with my experience perfectly, as well as the thousands of gym bros that were probably right. We've all seen these dudes that bench with their legs up. How was that any different from a Larson press other than maybe being a little bit more unstable? The effect on the pecs should be comparable. And what I can say is that in my experience, I've never had such intense chest contractions in my life from a bench press. To the point where this is the biggest my pecs have ever been. Despite me not touching the lows that I used to use with a lot of leg drive. So just a little something that I wanted to point out. Some of you might argue, well, Alex, it's because your upper back got thicker and that's what's increasing the measurement. I'm sure that's a possibility. But even if we take that stance, there's still something to this. Because at the very least, I haven't regressed. Progressive overload seems to be the same, if not better. And the stimulus to fatigue ratio of the Larson press is overall better. Also, I want to address this claim that it's because the weights were heavier. It's interesting that people mention that because... The evidence seems to suggest the complete opposite, that when you use a lower percentage, the pecs get worked more. Basically, the closer you reach to your one rep max, the triceps and shoulders start to take on a bit more blunt of that load. So if this study is showing that a higher percentage increases chest activation, well, then it goes against what we know about the regular bench, meaning it's actually proof that your chest does get worked more. Crazy, right? But I'm not being irrational here, and I'd love to hear your feedback on this. The Larson Press seems to have a slight edge than the competition style bench, or at least be similar enough that you don't have to use that technique to grow. Finally, I'd like to briefly cover some variations that I'd strongly recommend. The first being the Zero Retraction Larson Press. Who is this for? Anyone who has good leverages on the bench press meaning your arm is either at parallel or slightly above. Anyone who has those really long gorilla arms way past the bench, you probably don't have to do this because your default style is already extended range of motion. But for a guy who doesn't have that advantage, and yes, it is an advantage for hypertrophy, having a 100% flat back will maximize the way to stretch on the pecs and therefore make you even stronger in that position. In terms of weights dropped, it'll be another 5-10% but likely on the lower side. And I'd strongly recommend that if you have zero experience with no retraction movements, that you at least experiment with dips and push-ups to refine the scapulohumeral rhythm, as well as dropping the percentage considerably. So on day one, I would caution against using 70% right now, maybe because you don't have the optimal tissue capacity. So lower down to around 50, use what's within your current capabilities. And if you're able to add more, you do so. Now the final variation for today with a straight bar is the Incline Larson Press, also known as the Butler Press. Basically, you're wedged into the seat, which prevents you from sliding your butt forward, AKA turning the incline into a flat angle, which many of us have been guilty of doing. So this style maintains proper positioning, which is the main benefit because let's keep it real, most people aren't really using leg drive on inclines to begin with. So you might not notice a huge difference in weight here, it might only be about 5%, but the fact that the form is more accountable makes it very worth it. Plus you might feel these a little bit more in your upper chest compared to front delts. Not to mention the fact that no retraction works here too, which makes an even bigger difference on incline. Oftentimes I'll see guys being really tight and their chin is almost equivalent to their chest level, which indicates that they're not actually doing an incline press. These are the culprits that you see repping three plates easily. I'm talking about the natties here. It's not that their upper chest is that big or strong. 
it's that they're cheating themselves. So please be very mindful of that. And with that said, that's about all I have to say on the Larson Press. This was my updated video. I hope you learned some new things. And if you've been on the same journey, let's hear your feedback in the comment section. What have you noticed from this amazing exercise? Let's hear it. And I'll talk to you all next time.